History of editing. The magic lantern was first invented in 1820 and was the first projector to be made. The magic lantern was the first still painted image on glass. It was commonly used for educational and entertainment purposes. Here is a video on the magic lantern with someone explaining it. Describe the world of pre-cinema, it's best to think about our own multimedia world where we're surrounded by visual images all the time, whether they're on screens, on phones, on ATM machines, on, on flat screen TVs. There was a similar sort of excitement about the visual image during the Victorian period. There was also a similar growth in the number of devices that offered different kinds of moving images, different kinds of projected images and different type of 3D images, all enormously popular and successful for most of the Victorian period. The first idea about projected images comes to the West, I suppose, in the 17th century. But quite soon after that, you have ideas like the camera obscura. You still get them today in many cities. You also get the magic lantern uh, coming through at the end of the 17th century. And it remains probably the most popular form of movie image entertainment up to um, the advent of cinema. A magic lantern is basically a simple slide projector uh, uses uh, images painted on glass or photographs on glass but most people might think that's a kind of be all and end all of it that it just produces still images and that's not the case at all because many of the images actually have moving parts some of them have uh, levers sliding pieces of glass and also if you bank up your lanterns you have two or three lanterns working in tandem then it's possible to produce transformations dissolves all kinds of wonderful tricks and that, in a way, is why it's called a magic lantern. And it retained that name right up until the beginning of cinema and beyond. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Bonzo, the wonder dog. Now, Bonzo will perform a wonderful trick for you. He is going to leap into the air straight through the hoop at the word of command. And the word of command is hoopla. Here we go. Keep your eye on the dog. How one, two, three, hoopla. Now that's very difficult to do. Years of practice. I've always been interested in weird and wonderful forms of entertainment and of course in cinema. But I saw an article in a local paper about a man who collected magic lantern slides. Now I thought I knew what a magic lantern was. I thought it was a just basically a projector, a little metal projector which showed glass images, pictures of the Norfolk Broads and those boring things that missionaries used to produce, photographs of um, their work in various countries and I thought that was probably the limit of what a magic lantern did. Anyway, he showed me all these wonderful slides, they were hand painted, there were wonderful narrative sequences, some uh, showing uh, just an amazing array of material. The first lantern slides were hand-painted and drawn directly onto the glass. And round about the 1820s, a process came in called the copper plate process, which enabled you to print an outline onto the glass. And that really also saw the beginning of photographic images and, of course, mass production of magic lantern slides. Now, you may be wondering, who invented this wonderful device, the magic lantern? Well, we don't know. What we do know is that it was used by conjuring priests, like this chap you see here, to literally put the fear of God into people in ancient times. People ask me the question, which is, what is a magic lantern show? And really, it's a very difficult question to answer, because it, it basically was anything that you wanted it to be. So you could buy some of this great array of material that was commercially available. You could even make your own slides. There were shows which were full of uh, thunder and lightning and theatrical percussion noises. Sometimes they would have been presented by spiritualists, sort of charlatan showmen who would have presented pictures on smoke in such a way that people had thought that they were supernatural images. There was a great spectrum of um, activity for the Magic Lantern, even in the early days, it appealed to all classes. So performances were for anybody who cared to come along. It was a 
a huge industry. In the world that Dickens lived, he would have been surrounded by the new visual and optical devices of the period. Living in London, he couldn't but have seen kind of the adverts for Magic Lantern shows, panoramas, or kind of stereoscopes. These would have been kind of on posters, on billboards. Well, we know for certain that Charles Dickens saw the Magic Lantern when he was um, a young boy. Uh, when he was in Chatham, I think uh, the next door neighbours boy had a magic lantern and used to come around and entertain them with it. So he would certainly know about the lantern and there were certainly allusions to the magic lantern in a lot of his works. You can see that there are references and they're used to describe characters, they're used to describe the process of the imagination. Dickens once said that writing away from London was like writing away from the magic lantern he used as his inspiration. So Dickens saw the magic lantern as a kind of trope for the, for the imagination itself. In 1863, the Royal Polytechnic presented an illusion known as Pepper's Ghost. The actors walk onto the stage and suddenly the image of a ghost appears uh, on the stage with them. And it's done by projecting a bright light on a hidden character, usually below the stage, and that's thrown onto the, onto the glass. Well, the first playlet they used was the story by Dickens of The Haunted Man. Of course, it was a natural progression, really, for Lantern Slide producers to look to the works of Dickens. He was, after all, one of the most popular writers of the time. There were certain supernatural elements as well in Dickens' work, which worked very well for The Magic Lantern, certainly with uh, Gabriel Grubb, the story of the sexton and the goblins. Dickens gave lots of readings up and down the country, and as part of the process for this, he was always cutting down his own narratives. So with A Christmas Carol, for example, you'd get two or three set-piece scenes that everybody would know, and those would always be the scenes that would then be transferred into the Magic Lantern slide or to early cinema. So audiences would have recognised the iconography of the images straight away, and people would have really kind of responded to that familiarity. One of the characteristics of Dickens' popularity is the sheer number of different adaptations from the very, very beginning of his career and right up until today. So there's always something of a circularity about Dickens' popularity. He's popular be because he was adapted so much, and he's also adapted so much because he was popular. The next device that was made was the Thomatrobe in 1825. Um, this would either be credited to John Arton Paris or P Peter Mark Rojet. It was made to give off illusions. It was, a pop it was popular but a simple toy in the 19th century, the Victorian times. It was a disc, a circular piece of card or paper with an image on each side of th with two pieces of string attached to each side. You spin the string and watch the image appear appear to blend together. I did a fish bowl and a fish. It appears, it appears as if the fish was in the bowl. The thaumatrobe also means turning marble or wonder turner. This device was the first of many optical toys that provided entertainment until the development of mod modern cinemas. Although the thaumatrobe does not produce animated scenes, it relies on the same vision principle that other optical toys use that create the illusion of motion. The bird in the cage is the most common one to, see, to be seen on Thobotro.
The zoetrope was developed in 1864 by William George Horner. It was one of the several pre-cinema animation devices that produced the illusion of motion by displaying a sequence of 12 images which appears as if they were moving moving by the spinning de- by spinning the device. The slits on the device that you look through to see the image give the illusions that the images were actually moving. The zoetrope was first named the Dedatum by the inventor William George Horner, but was renamed to the Zobotrope by the French inventor Pierre Devines. The Zobotrope was a step in development for film and television. On the surface, modern media technology looked different from optical toys from the 1800s, but they share common properties. The illusion of motion depends on two things, the persistence of vision and the phenomenon. Persistence of the vision, first noted in 1820 by Peter Mark Roget, um, refers to the length of the time our eyes retain an image, while the phenomenon is the result of the human instinct the, as the brain strives to make meaning of what we can see. Pranksinscope was a more developed version of the zoetrope. It was made in 1877 by Charles Emily Renaud. Similar to the zoetrope, it used a sequence of images placed around a spinning cylinder. It was improved by removing the slits with mirrors, so the images looked more stationary as the cylinder was spun. Someone looking into the mirror would see a sequence of images move. I then looked at Edward, Edward Mybridge. He invented a device called the Zoopatrixobe, made in 1879, a method of projecting animation versions of his images as a short moving sequence. So I did the same. I photographed someone moving in 12 shots. This is what you, this is what you can currently see. However, this is the slowed down version to show you what it should look like. I'm now going to show you what the image looks like when putting it against my British's device. I changed the frames of two seconds long and this is what it looks like. The zoo scope projected images from a rotating glass disc in a succession to give the impression of motion. The zoo scope was introduced through my British photography, what he was best known for. Like the Zobotrobe, this was an early development towards the technologies we have today. The Illumia brothers captured movement in 1895, and this is what the first films used to look like. The Illumia brothers set up their camera in one position and just recorded the action going on around them. So I did the same, I set up my camera at the bottom of the stairs and recorded my own moving footage. With no sound. The footage I showed you was one of the most famous films done by the Illumia brothers called A Train Pulling Into A Station, lasting only 50 seconds. It is an 1895 French short black and white silent film. Cameras in these days did not capture sound, so all films were silent. The Lumiere brothers recorded everyday aspects in life, and because there was no editing, films would only last 50 seconds. However, the Lumiere brothers were the first filmmakers in history, so their films were a big hit. The first film was Employees Leaving a Factory.
The first piece of edited footage was done by Edwin Porter in 1899. The first major step forward towards editing for Porter was his film The Life of American Fireman in 1904. Porter used editing to show the same events from the pers- pers- perspective of the woman and the man. This was the first time any form of editing had ever been used. Porter also developed the first editing transition. Instead of cutting from scene to scene, he made the first ever fade transition.
The modern day zoetrope is called the mastroscope, was first done in 1980 by Bill Brand as a public display of art which was restored in 2008 and can be seen in Brooklyn going into Manhattan on the underground subway. It consists of images with narrow slits through which the images are seen. However, the film is stationary and the train resembles as the film playing.